Welcome to episode 87 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast, or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. He's Lapore. I'm Bruno. Thank you so much for listening and watching us on YouTube as well. As of January 4th, 2023, first of all, Happy New Year to everybody out there in GFP Nation, all you Leaf fans, all you hockey fans. Mm-hmm. But as of January 4th, 2023, the Toronto Maple Leafs, I've been saying this on the last five or six podcasts, they are still a certified wagon. They are sitting second in the Atlantic Division on pace for a 114-point season. They have stumbled a little bit over their last few games with oh. a brutal loss to Arizona. They bounced back with a big win over Colorado. And recently just lost 6-5 in a shootout to St. Louis. So we're going to go over the week that was for the Leafs, give you our thoughts and opinions on everything that has gone down with that team. We're also going to talk about the upcoming NHL All-Star game in which Leafs might be going to the game. And then we're going to talk about Connor McDavid and the Edmonton Oilers. And I promise you're going to want to stay tuned for that conversation. But before we get into all that, it is time to officially welcome in my partner in crime, Mr. Michael Lapore, how you doing, man? Doing very well, Anthony Bruno. Happy New Year to everyone. As you mentioned, episode 87 of the Gluns for Punishment podcast. It's another one of them, Bruno. No player in the history of the Toronto Maple Leafs has ever donned the mighty number 87. But Sidney Crosby is a UFA in two years. Tavares' money comes off the books. So Leafs fans can dream. Leafs fans can dream. I've said before on this show that Sidney Crosby is uh, my second favorite player of all time uh, behind the Wainer. And I've also said on this show, I don't care about stats. I don't care who's winning the Hart Trophy, the Art Ross. Until Sidney Crosby retires, he is the boss, the absolute boss of the National Hockey League. Love you, Sid. Sidney Crosby is an absolute G, man. Like this guy just continues to put up points, continues to win. I love Sid. I'm right there with you, man. What, What an awesome player. Yeah, man, the best. All right, Lapore, let's get right into this. Okay. Let's talk some Leafs. Coming off a 6-5 shootout loss to the St. Louis Blues. It was the Leafs' first shootout of the season. Yeah. And uh, obviously, they lost in the shootout. That's now their seventh loss in either overtime or the shootout this season. And it was hilarious because we ha- I feel like we haven't seen the Leafs in a shootout in the last like two years. Yeah. So I forgot how good they, like some of their guys were in the shootout. Like Matthews had a sick move. Marner's goal was disgusting. Yeah. Even Rasmus Sandin had a great deke and Bennington made a great toe save on him. So it was unfortunate that the Leafs weren't able to pull out a win, but what are your thoughts, I guess, on the game that we just saw? And even if you want to bring up what you have felt about this team over the last three games. Okay, so with regard to last night, um, I don't think it's a hot take to say last night was one of the worst games the Leafs have played all season. And people immediately are saying, oh, what are you talking about? They got a point in a shootout. You know, had they won? No. Had the Leafs won in a shootout, I would be saying the exact same thing. Last night's performance was the exact opposite of what I'm hoping for from this team. And when you look forward to the playoffs, there's a certain style this team has to play and a certain brand this team has to play and a certain level this team has to play. And last night was not good enough. They let in an early goal. The goaltending was bad. Their special special teams were a joke. They were sloppy. They were giving up a lot of high danger scoring chances. As far as the money puck goes on the uh, deserve a win meter, it may have been their worst game of the season. And I wasn't shocked that things were too easy for St. Louis. I felt like they had no problems getting into like the low slot, taking shots, moving the puck around. The Leafs had a good third period, but I expect that. I mean, when you're playing from behind and you have some momentum, but I thought it was a bad, bad game, a bad, bad game. And like, let's, let's face it here. Now I'm going to rant. Leafs fans have fears. We've been playing very well defensively. We've been playing a structured game, but there's that little thing inside of us that's thinking, can we keep this up? Is that really our style? Are we more of a track meet team? And last night was a track meet. And I know Leafs fans do not want to see that. People on Twitter are saying, oh, come on, you were entertained. No, if I was a neutral, I would have been entertained. Not if I was cheering for the team that's fucking playing from behind and playing and playing terribly. So 
I, I wasn't impressed. I wasn't impressed. And after the loss to Arizona, I mean, they beat Colorado, but now this one, they got to dial in, man. This team has to get their mind frame back to where it was um, before the Christmas break. Because as I said, there's a certain brand of hockey this team wants to be playing come April. And last night was not it. Yeah, I agree with you. I didn't think the Leafs played well at all last night. They were sloppy. As you said, the goaltending wasn't good. Horrible. But I will say this, watching the game, if you want to put a positive spin on this, I kept feeling like the Leafs were going to come back to win the game. Of course. For <laughs> yeah, whatever reason. And and it, it, if that might be the only positive thing is that you know that when this team is down, especially when they're playing an inferior opponent, they're always in the game. Because all it takes is one power play, one rush, one awesome play from Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, William Nylander, and they're right back in the game. So even when the Leafs were down by two goals, I'm like, they're going to come back. And then St. Louis takes another lead, and I'm, I go, they're going to come back again. So that's the one positive thing I'll take is that I never felt like the Leafs were out of it as poorly yeah. as they played. Yeah. But yeah, at five on five, they weren't good. You know, allowing that early shorthanded goal to Brandon Saad, just a weak, weak goal from Ilya Samsonov. And things just were not clicking. And I was listening to Sheldon Keefe after the game, and he mentioned something interesting about the decor. Because I know there's been some takes out there, Lapore, about Morgan Riley. And since he's returned, like, he's been bad. And now the decor is a disaster. But Sheldon Keefe said, like, listen, our decor is going through a little bit of a transition now because guys are getting healthy. The pairings are all switching up. Right. And people need to adjust. He, he, I believe the word he used was recalibrate. Ooh, he goes fancy. <laughs> he goes, Morgan Riley hasn't played a game in like two months. Yeah. I know he's, you know, now played a couple of games since returning from injury. All the other moving parts on the blue line, right? Like this blue line's been in flux all season. So Sheldon Keefe acknowledged like it's going to take a little bit of time for guys to settle in and get back to the defensive game that we were playing previously where they were one of the best defensive teams in the league and they still are based on the numbers but you know it's been a little shaky the last couple of games and then another thing he mentioned which i thought was interesting was the play of Ilya samsonov here we go <laughs> he did say that samsonov should have had that first goal that brandon sod scored shorthanded like that was a weak goal i think we can all we can all say that but honestly keith said other than that he didn't think samsonov played that poorly he thought you know it was a couple of weird bounces they didn't really score any goals at five on five until later in the game the goals they did score at five on five were like point blank opportunities so as you said Lapore, i think he was basically echoing your statements being like the leafs just played like crap yeah not good enough like i said the thing is too bruno i i, I was in the same boat you were i never counted them out I'm like, we can get back into this game. We might win this game. And it felt like the Leafs were going to win the game. But we have the talent to do that. So we're not surprised. Like, to me, that's every game, really. I mean, you look at, we pay guys 11.65 million, 11 million, 11 million. Yeah, the, when we're down two goals to an inferior opponent, we should still be in the game. So I'm happy we have that. And... It can excite fans because again, we're all, we're always in the game, but based on what we're paying these guys and who they are and what I expect from them, I'm not impressed. Yeah. And, and that's totally fair. Like that was just not a good game at all. Like you can't, if you're a Leaf fan and you watched, you know, the full 60 minutes plus overtime in the shootout, you can't tell us with a straight face that the Leafs played well. Mm -hmm. It was, it was mm -hmm. a sloppy game and you know, they got a point out of it. So that's positive and they're still on a pretty good pace here. Unfortunately, the Boston Bruins are just playing ridiculous hockey right now. I, yeah. I, you know, I've been joking around saying this team's never going to lose another game. Like it's absurd. They're 29, four and four. Yeah. Crazy. It's just, it's wild. The Leafs right now have the third best record in the NHL, the third best record in the NHL. And they are most likely going to finish second in the Atlantic division because this Boston team just can't lose. Yeah. What are they like 10 points behind Boston now or something? I think they've played the same amount of games. Yeah. Right now they're nine points behind Boston and oh, Boston okay. has a game in hand. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so with regard to the Bruins and man, people co comment down below about this one, because from what I've noticed anyway, with the Bruins and you can attribute some of this to heart and character 
you can attribute some of this to having a winning mentality or you can point to luck. But is it just me or except we're all Leafs fans? We're all following the Bruins, seeing how they're doing. Is it just me or every game? They, they score a late goal every game. I feel like there, there's been at least 10 times this season where they're down by one. They score 30 seconds off. They win in overtime or at least they score to get the point. It seems. And again, there's different reasons for that. I just find maybe it's happening very, very often. Very often. And I'll have to go over the games. I just feel that way based on, again, checking my apps and checking scores. How many times I've seen them like down by one in the third and oh, they won in, they won in overtime. Like what? What, like, well, what did I miss? And it seems to be happening all the time. And again, I give them credit for that because they have to do it. But I think that seems to be the biggest reason or a major reason for the Leafs having the season they're having but still having that points differential between the Bruins where these games that the Bruins probably quote unquote should lose they're winning. I'm not taking anything away from Boston. Because no, I, I'm not either. They, I don't, I don't be taken the wrong way. No, no, hundred percent. Like I think they've had a phenomenal season. You look at the underlying numbers, yeah, you look at the just the regular game. accounting stats. Like this team is a juggernaut across the board, but you have to have a little bit of luck, man, to go right. 29, four and four. Yeah. Like that is absurd. Like I, I don't care how good you are to have that record after whatever, how, however many games they've played 38 games, 37 games. Like that's just, it, it's insane. And Lapore, I'll just run down like their last five games played kind of alluding to the point that you made how, you know, they're winning all these one goal games, their last win against Pittsburgh in the winter classic two to one. They did lose. And they scored late. They over. They scored two late third. They two, sorry, they scored two goals in the third period. They were down yeah, by one. Exactly. The two Jake DeBrus goals. They did lose four three in overtime to Buffalo. Okay. The game before that, they beat the Devils three to one. They lost to the Senators three two in a shootout. Yeah. But then the two games before that, they beat New Jersey four three. They beat Winnipeg three two. So Wonderful. they're playing like they play in a lot of close games. Like they score a lot of goals, but they were scoring a lot of goals you know, the first couple months of the season recently, they've been grinding out like some one goal victories. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's just like, they've been on the right side of everything this season. It seems. Yeah. They had the discussion on the panel, um, whether or not they'll, I think they're on pace for like 140 points or something. If they'll break uh, the Canadians record for uh, points in a season. And there's a whole debate because of the shootout and overtime. But I think I saw somewhere as well, based on how they're playing their underlying numbers they should finish and it's incredible. They should finish around 120 points and they're pushing for 140. So like to the point about like thing, even beyond being an amazing team, like you said, to hit those kind of numbers, a lot has to go your way. You said they have what? Four regulation losses, four regulation losses in and, 37 games. And one was to Arizona. That one, they got scored on in the, in the last second or whatever to lose to Arizona. So they're that close to only having three halfway through the season. Like, this doesn't make sense. It's wild. And one Crazy. was also against the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah, I think Ottawa, too. I think Ottawa was, like, when they started, like, 15-1. and one, I think Ottawa was their only Yeah, loss. Ottawa beat them 7-5. It was Boston's fourth game of the season. Okay, there you yeah, go. Yeah, so their four, their four regulation losses, 7-5 to Ottawa. They lost 2-1 to the Leafs in Toronto. They lost 5-2 to Florida in Florida. And then lost... 4-3 to Arizona in Arizona. There you go. So they actually have not lost at home in regulation this season. Incredible. That's the, absurd. I'll touch on this about Arizona, and then we'll move on. It's popped in my head. I was thinking this during the Leaf game. Leafs, I mean, they dominated play because they should dominate play against a team like the Coyotes, and they lost. I just mentioned how the Bruins lost. Uh, in Arizona and also Colorado has lost in Arizona and if I'm not mistaken someone pointed out the record um, for Arizona at home and at the point of where they beat the Leafs it, percentage wise it was one of the best in the NHL and I'm not making excuses for my favorite team there's no reason you should ever even be in a game with the Arizona Coyotes based on the lineups but let's step back here a second okay you're flying into a warm climate okay I assume most of these guys are getting in around a golf they're going for a nice dinner. You know you're playing a terrible opponent that's tanking. You're playing in this weird building. And I, I said, it's happened to the Leafs. It happened uh, to the Avalanche. And it happened to the Bruins. To me, it, it just so sets up to be a trap. 
it 150% sets up to be a trap because it's just so hard to be dialed into this game. Like I said, warm climate. You probably got there a day or two early to take advantage of it. Weak opponent. The weird arena. And again, not no excuses. Did you see the lighting in that arena? Oh, it was horrible. There was like shadows all over the ice. Like, like I've, I've played in rinks around here that for like junior B and junior A games. And the, the lighting's better than yeah, that. There's like, better I, rinks in the, in the GTHL. 100%. I promise you that in the greater Toronto hockey league than mullet arena in Arizona. You know what I don't understand about that? So I follow an Instagram account, um, everything college hockey, ECH great account. Anyone who's an NCAA hockey fan and they'll show facilities and rinks of some of these big program teams. And they're beautiful. Like these rinks are absolutely beautiful. Like I saw one, like the entire side of the building was windows so here you have this rink with seats all around, and then one side was all windows, so you get natural light in. So it, it looked and felt amazing, and I'm sure the lighting's good there. Here you had the, the NHL playing here in this NCAA rink, and there's Arizona State is a program. I'm just confused as to why it's not better. I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, and, and looking at their record, you said it, man. Right now, Arizona has played 12 games at home. They are 7-3-2. and two. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. I knew it was like 7-3 or 7-2 and something, yeah. And on the road, they're 6-15-3. and three. Woo. Wild. So I think you're onto something there, Lepore. I think I got to look at uh, the next big-time opponent that they're playing on home ice, and I'm just going to bet on the Coyotes. Oh, man, it's, it's a total, total trap. Because even to, even if you're the even you're, if you're up by one, you're still, like, a little nervous because, you know, this team's just hanging on and being annoying, and you got to score two goals early and end it. This is what you got to do. It's wild, yeah. So if you're playing the Arizona Coyotes, you think you're a good hockey team? Think again, because as Lepore mentioned, it is the ultimate trap game at Mullet Arena, as we've seen so far this season. Skip the round of golf, boys. <laughs> oh, you can't skip the round of golf. That's man. true. It's time for a quick break to wish you a happy new year from our friends over at Manscaped. The ball yeah. has officially dropped, but that doesn't mean you have to drop the ball on your balls in 2023. Oh. The leaders in below the waist grooming have you covered for your much needed resolution of bringing sexy back. Join the 7 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our exclusive offer. Go to manscaped.com and use the promo code GFP20 for 20% off and free shipping. Lapore Manscaped simply does not miss. You know what, Bruno? I see Manscaped as kind of like one of those stores where you go in there and whatever you want, whatever you need, they got it. You want something to clean clean your balls? It's there. Something to clean your nose and ears? It's there. You want a shampoo and conditioner? You want a body wash? It's there. They got the body scrubs, the body spray, the underwear. Manscaped is A plus all around. Like I said, whatever you want, they got it. Head to manscaped.com, GFP20 for 20% off and free shipping. If you're a man and you want to take your game to the next level in 2023, <laughs> I promise you, you want Manscaped products. As Lepore said, they have everything you could possibly want to bring your game to the next level. So do the right thing in 2023 to all the men out there. You get 20% off and free shipping using our promo code GFP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com using the promo code GFP20. All right, Lepore. I know we talked about this on the last podcast, but... Let's just bring it up again because <laughs> I think people because are it's starting that to, concerning. People are starting to get a little. I mean, people are already a little worried, but a, a yeah. little more worried, let's say, with Ilya Samsonov, who had another stinker against St. Louis. Though mm -hmm. so he has now allowed 17 goals on his last 113 shots over his last four games for an 850 save percentage. And if you just go look at Ilya Samsonov's career numbers, so his first season in Washington, 913 save percentage. His next season, 902 save percentage. And then last year, he dips under 900 for the first time with an 896 save percentage. Signs a one-year deal with the Leafs. So he was hovering around like a 900 career save percentage playing on the Washington Capitals. Comes to the Leafs. His first 10 starts were ridiculous. He went 9-0. At home, he had the best save percentage in the NHL. Yeah. Is everything now, like, has the clock struck midnight 
on Ilya Samsonov at this point? Like, how worried should we actually be about this? Yeah, uh, I hope I'm wrong, but I think it has. He does not look good in there. Like, there's the old saying about goalies not knowing where their posts are. I feel that way with him. And to me, it's not about, like, let's face it. I I love Gretzky's old quote, stats are for losers, because he would point to Grant Fuhrer, who we played with in Edmonton, and it didn't matter if he had played poorly and let in five goals. If it was 5-5, five, five, he wasn't going to let in the next one. So with goalie stats are bullshit. Things change every game, opponents, the types of chances. It's just how the goalie looks to me. Like a goalie can get beat for five, but if he had no chance in any of them and he otherwise looked confident, okay, fine. It is what it is. That's the sport. But I am not getting that from him. Like he, he feels small in the net. I feel like everything that hits him is going to trickle past him or like he's gonna like lose it like he's gonna, it's gonna fall out of his glove or something like that i'm not feeling it man and like the numbers i just said the numbers don't matter but the numbers are there in the way that he's been really really bad like borderline pathetic and i've danced around it on this show in recent weeks saying that in my opinion now we're kind of seeing that murray is the starter and sammy's the backup it looked like we were going to kind of have a two-headed monster running um, based on the way things were going earlier in the season. But I don't want to say Sammy's like completely lost my confidence, but I'm not betting on him now. Like, I think I've seen enough. Because even too, again, I'll be honest, when he went on his crazy run, I still felt the same thing. I'm like, he doesn't look amazing in there. He doesn't look overly confident, overly calm. So I think right now he's the backup goalie. I mean, again, I hope I'm wrong. I hope he snaps the hell out of it. But I am not confident that we're going to see a huge turnaround from Elias Antonov. Now, I don't think he'll be as bad as he's been because that's almost impossible to do. But I don't know, man. To me, he's the backup. And here's the thing. He's going to have to continue playing games because the Leafs do not want to burn out Matt Murray right? based on his injury history, based on the fact that this guy hasn't had a full workload at pretty much forever like you go look at Matt Murray even you know his time in Pittsburgh like he was sharing the net with Marc-Andre Fleury like the most games that Matt Murray has played in a season is 50 games okay so they can't be running him out there and burning him out as good as Murray has been so that might be the most concerning thing of all is that Samsonov's not going anywhere like he's gonna still get a ton of starts Uh, uh. the last half of the season I don't think he's as bad as we have seen over these last four games. Like an 850 save percentage is really bad. Yeah. Like that's just horrible. And I also don't think he's as good as we saw over his first nine to 10 starts where he had the best save percentage in the NHL. It's somewhere in between. And as good as the Leafs are defensively, as good as the Leafs are just as a, as a, as a complete team, I have faith that they will be able to mask the issues of Ilya Samsonov because that's exactly what they did last season with yeah. Jack Campbell and Peter Morazic and had their best regular season in franchise history. So unless Ilya Samsonov completely goes into the tank and he's allowing four or five goals every night, I think the Leafs are going to be fine. But as I said, the one concerning thing is that it's not like he's going to be sitting on the bench here. He's still going to be playing a lot of games and splitting the net with Matt Murray, who the Leafs, do not want to take any chances with based on his injury history. But yeah, I, I don't think there's really any more to say about that. Lapore. like Matt Murray's the guy. Samsonov is the backup game. One of the playoffs. It's going to be Matt Murray unless he's injured. And hopefully Samsonov just stays afloat here and doesn't completely shit the bed for this team. I'll throw this one at you, Bruno. And this may become a topic as the season goes on. Should the Leafs make a trade for some goalie insurance? It's interesting. I don't think that's on their radar right now. And I think as a management team, I think like everything is just naturally on your radar. So I'm kind of contradicting myself. I I think as a general manager, as a front office, like you're always looking at ways that you can improve your team. But I don't think that's at the forefront. Like, let's go get another goalie here. I, I still think... When you look at their numbers overall, like Matt Murray, 920 save percentage this year. Samsonov has now dipped to a 914 save percentage. I don't think it's totally time to press the panic button and go look around for a goalie. But honestly, Lapore, if you feel like there is a better insurance policy out there than Ilya Samsonov, that's a move that you could make. It really is at the trade deadline. If you think there's a better backup out there 
it's not all out of the realm of possibility. I'll throw this one at you, Bruno. What could the Buffalo Sabres possibly ask for for Craig Anderson? Who's having a really good season. I think he's like a 9-2-4, 9-2-3 or something. He's winning games. That is like the ultimate veteran backup goalie right here. He'll be fine. He's not gonna he's not gonna win it for you. He's not gonna lose it for you. He'll be fine. Who knows? Maybe he stands on his head. Yeah, that that's interesting. And and yeah, I think that the Leafs will explore things like that, especially if it continues going downhill here for Samsonov. I think they've put a lot of faith in him. They've stood behind him, working with the new goalie coach, like showing their confidence in him and how he's a new guy now and you know, he has had a, a good season overall, but yeah, man, if, if there's a guy like Craig, if, if Craig Anderson continues playing the way that he's playing right now with Buffalo, I mean, that's something you got to look at, man. If you're it, not just the Leafs, any contender who Friggin feels right. like they need an insurance policy and net behind their starter, <laughs> it's a pretty good option. How high of a pick would you trade? Oh, for it. Uh, I'm not trading like a first or a second round. No, pick. of course not. Like I was saying, I was thinking like a third or a fourth. Is what yeah, I, was I think that's probably what it would take for for a goalie at this point. I feel like we've seen similar trades like that over the last few years for these like sort of like middle of the road goalies where it's like a third or a fourth rounder gets dealt for them. Big save Dave, remember? That's yeah. right. David Riddick. Friggin' horrible. <laughs> yeah, man. No, that's uh, I it got it got the wheels turning in my brain a little bit, Lapore. I yeah. mean, I don't think it's going to get to that point, but I would not be surprised if this slide continues and the Leafs start looking at goalies out there. Oh, gross. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to our next topic now. Shall we? The NHL All-Star Game is coming up in February. I believe Ooh. it is February 4th in Florida. I think that's the exact date of the All-Star Game. And the All-Star Game is, it's its I don't want to call it a total sham but it is kind of, <laughs> I, I feel like it, it, it's the fact that there has to be a representative from every team. Right. It kind of rubs me the wrong way. So when you look at the Atlantic division, there's been some really good seasons from some really good players. And as it stands right now, it looks like there's probably only going to be one leaf at the all-star game. I don't think anyone on the Leafs blue line is making the Atlantic division all-star team. One of their goalies is not going to make the team because you have Linus Allmark, who's having a phenomenal season for Boston, and Vasilevsky is also having a really good season for Tampa. So it, at this point, and I, I've gone through the list, I've made my own Atlantic Division All-Star team. It looks like there's only going to be one, maybe, maybe two Leafs. So Lapore, if you had to pick one Leaf to make this year's All-Star game, who would that be? It should be. We Willie Nylander, but it won't be. <laughs> It'll be Austin Matthews because it's the NHL and they got to push the brand. They got to push the American kid who won the heart and um, the Maurice Rocker Richard trophy the last two years. That'd be an interesting trivia question. Has a heart trophy winner um, ever missed the following all-star game? Like that, that'd be a good one. Willie's had an incredible year scored again last night. His pace is around what? Like 45 goals, which is, obviously a career high for him and unbelievable. So he would deserve it. Um, but if I was a betting man, I'd be pushing towards Matthews for the reasons I mentioned. And like you said, I mean, it doesn't really matter. There's, there's a lot of annoying sports debates when people debate over who should be and who should not be at the all-star game. Like I just roll my eyes because it, it's a circus. And it's funny. I remember being a little kid, and like staying up late to watch the all-star game in the early nineties and all that. I just gave away my age. Um, and I remember like, it was a game. Like, first of all, the, the, there wasn't the one, uh, one player per team rule. I mean, like the Oilers would have like six, seven, six, seven players at certain, there's that photo of them. I forget which all-star game it is where it's like, they had both goalies, Moog, Fuhr, Gretzky, Messier, Curry, Anderson, Lowe, like all of them were at the all-star game playing for the West. And that's when it mattered and it was cool and people cared about the records. I mean, now it's like a Harlem Globetrotters game. It's just for fun. But on the topic of the Leafs, yeah, Nylander deserves it and it would be great. Um, I would give him another bargaining chip at the uh, at the negotiation table. But I, I think it's going to end up being Matthews. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. Like, It is annoying that there has to be a representative from each team. But also when these guys finish their careers and some of them are going to be up for the hall of fame 
you know, when you're talking about current all-stars of today and not all of them are going to be hall of famers, obviously, but you know, that stuff matters to a certain degree. Like this player was an eight time all-star or a 10 time all-star. So I think the NHL should, should honestly take it a little bit more seriously than it does. Okay. Um, And not that that's the be all and end all that's like, let's say the seventh thing on the list that you look at, like how many all-star appearances did this guy have? Right. Yeah. So I don't know. I, 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 it doesn't sit well with me in any sport when you have to have a representative from each team, but Lapore, I do agree with you. I think it's probably going to be Matthews and I believe they're still doing the, the fan vote to pick the captains for the all-star team where there's a captain of each division. So Matthews is going to have a pretty good chance to win that captaincy. And that could be the Leafs entry right there. But I agree with you, Lepore. I think if you're going to pick one player, I think it has to be Nylander. He now leads the Leafs in goals and points. He has been consistent game in and game out. I know Marner has the 23-game point streak, and that was stealing all the headlines a couple of weeks ago. And I know Austin Matthews is Austin Matthews, and he's still having a good season, 19 goals, over a point per game. But if you had to pick one player on this team who deserves it, I think, honestly, I think they all deserve it to a certain degree, especially considering how great the Leafs have been this season. Like, those three have been the driving force behind this Leafs team. But if I had to pick one of those three right now, and it, you know, would have sounded crazy three or four years ago, even two years ago, it's William Nylander, man. That guy has been an absolute beast this season. Yeah, you mentioned, like, the Hall of Fame thing with uh, with regard to All-Star Game appearances. Kevin Lowe, if I mentioned Kevin Lowe, because I mentioned the Oilers, he jumped in my mind because I remember there was a lot of debate when he got announced to the Hockey Hall of Fame because of the circumstances of playing for the Oilers and all that. There are people pointing to his All-Star Game appearances, and that's what I was just looking up. He played in seven. The guy played in seven All-Star Games, and if that pushed him into the Hall of Fame, I don't know. But before we move on, I want to bring up a topic briefly that I bring up every year when it comes to the All-Star Game, okay? And with the new format of four teams... It would be the perfect scenario. People know I love my jerseys, okay? The NHL has done a terrible job, an absolutely terrible job with the All-Star Game jerseys in recent memory. I can't even remember one that I'm like, well, that's nice. No, they were all like weird or different or trying too hard to be cool. You have four teams, okay? Have two teams, home and away, in the jerseys from the early 90s the black with the orange and white trim. And then you do the white with the black and orange trim, two teams in those. And on the hundredth anniversary of the NHL, sorry, the hundredth anniversary of the Stanley cup, I should say they did those uh, red and white ones with the blue stripes on the arms. So have two teams in those have two teams in the black and orange all-star game jerseys from the early nineties. And it'll be a beautiful thing. Sale NHL. I hope you're listening. Sales will go through the roof. If people can buy, a Crosby jersey in that black and orange or a Matthews jersey in that red with the blue stripes with like the different vintage font. Amazing. Like get your shit together. I love that Lapore and anything jerseys. Like I'm just deferring to Lapore immediately Thanks, because this guy is the ultimate Jersey guy. As I'm sure most of you know, our longtime listeners, that's a great idea, man. And I agree. I think those jerseys would fly off the shelves during the star weekend. I, I, even in the jerseys they make for the teams today, I don't understand why teams, I don't want to say they don't take risks, but they don't want to do something that's like a little different. Like those jerseys in the early nineties for the all-star game, they had the stars going around the socks. It's awesome. Like it looked awesome. The little details like that with the black and the orange and the white. Awesome. Like I find now they just go like totally neutral and it's like something you can't hate, but something you can't love either. Cause I think it's like a safe way to go and no one will hate it. So people will buy it based on the player or whatever. But man, like, again, like I'm just picturing, like I, I said, Matthew's in the red. Imagine Nylander in the black and orange. He's got like the Leafs patch on the shoulder. Amazing. So sick. I, I totally buy one, but. And, and you said it, Lepore, the one word safe, safe. The NHL 100%. is safe. No matter what they do, you know, when it comes to branding the game, the all-star game, Everything that they do, the word that comes to mind, and I think the word that describes it perfectly is safe. Wow. wow. Horrible. Anyway. Yeah. We got to talk about something that recently came up on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Ooh, Spit and Chicklets. They were discussing the Edmonton Oilers, and 
what the team should do with Connor McDavid and whether it actually makes sense for Come the on. Oilers to wait for it, <sighs> wait for it, to trade Connor McDavid, the best player in the world. I know Bruno. I know it's coming from a Leafs podcast to Leaf fans. I know get get in your hate comments. I know it's already coming. But yeah, when you think about it, it actually does make sense. And I know Oilers fans are going to come at us right now and say, you could say the same thing about the Leafs. They haven't won a playoff series and Matthew's contract is coming up and they should trade him too. And guess what? We have actually acknowledged that on this podcast. Like it might get to a point where if Matthews does not sign his extension on July 1st, 2023, like the Leafs are actually going to have to consider trading him. That's in the realm of possibility. The same thing with William Nylander, whose contract expires at the exact same time as Austin Matthews. So with the Edmonton Oilers, man, this team is not good. All right. Like they have been struggling this <laughs> Bruno. season. They are sitting fifth in the Pacific Division, which I think is the worst division in hockey. Disagree with me if you want. I think it's the worst. They are 20th in points percentage. So essentially, they have the 20th best record in the NHL. They are 21st in the league in goals against, and they have a minus six goal differential. At five on five. And if you want to look at goals for percentage at five on five, the Oilers sit 21st in the NHL, scoring 48% of the goals at five on five. Like, just not a good team, man. And you have the best player in the world, Connor McDavid, who's having another phenomenal season. He's probably going to win the Hart Trophy again. What do you do if you're Edmonton, man? Because, Laporte, this team, again, and I know they were in the same boat last year around this time where it looked like they were going to miss the playoffs and then they went on a torrid pace. They get Evander Kane and everything's hunky-dory and they make the conference finals. But they're in the same position again, man. They could miss the playoffs again. Like, this is this team should be nowhere near this spot right now. So what do you think? Like, should they actually trade Connor McDavid? Okay, here's the thing. We are all passionate fans of our favorite team, whether it's the Leafs, whether it's the Oilers, whether it's somebody else. And we feel connections to our players. And when topics like this come up, a lot of people naturally get defensive. Why would this player not want to play for my favorite team in my favorite market? That's ridiculous. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. And if I'm an Oilers fan here, to me on this on this um on this topic i don't want to say i'm neutral but i have the whole play in my head of it, it kind of is what it is and i'll revert it back to matthews like you did if we go into next year and matthews is unsigned and it doesn't look like he's going to sign well we have to make that move and by we i mean the Toronto Maple Leafs organization and me as a fan well i'd rather us move him and get something than lose him for nothing so there's nothing there's really to be upset about is what i'm getting at So as far as it goes with McDavid, they got to get in his brain or they have to have a sit down and be like, look, do you see your longtime future as an Edmonton Oiler? And if he does, great. You have Connor McDavid. If he does not, you have to at some point look at those options. And that doesn't mean right now or in the summer or even after one year, one year after this, and you, you said he's got three years left on his deal. But again, if I'm an Oilers fan, I would rather trade Connor McDavid and who knows what the fuck you would get for Connor McDavid as opposed to just losing him for nothing. Ask Islanders fans about Tavares. What happened to them? Like that sucks. That's like devastating for a franchise. Like think of that turnaround and I'll say it. I think back to when uh, Sun- Sundin, uh, I almost said Sandine, <laughs> when Sundin walked in uh, in free agency, when we were apparently trying to trade him at the deadline. And I remember him, he didn't want to be like a deadline acquisition. He said, I mean, at least he said that publicly. He said, oh, he didn't see himself like, you know, the vision of him winning a cup was not that way, which and I kind of call bullshit to Matt's because he then he joined the Canucks like halfway through the season. But that hurt our franchise. Matt Sundin at the trade deadline would have been a huge haul for a team. And we got nothing. So if the Leafs could have started that sort of rebuild or weak spot with two prospects and and teams did this back then, two prospects, a a first round pick and like a body in the lineup, things could have been different. It changes a lot. So again, to sum it up, you want what's best for your team. So it doesn't really matter. 
all that matters is if that player, and we're talking about Connor McDavid, wants to be with that team for an extended period of time. Because if he doesn't, and again, that is what it is. You can't control that. You can't convince him. And I'm talking about any player. You have to make the move. You have to do what's better for the organization. So if I'm if I'm an Oilers fan and Connor doesn't want to be here, I want it done. And to be honest, it, unless you really think this team can win a Stanley Cup by the end of his contract, I would want it to happen sooner rather than later because the longer he's got on his deal, the more you're going to get in return for him. So it sucks to be a fan sometimes in these situations, but sometimes you have to sit back, catch reality, and ask yourself what is in fact better for your organization long-term. And never mind Connor McDavid, who after this season has three years remaining on his deal, they're going to have to make a tough decision on Leon Dreisaitl as well. Ching. Yeah. He has two years left on his contract and to bring the Leafs into it again, his contract expires at the same time as Mitch Marner's and John Tavares. And I'm not saying dry cycles coming to the Leafs or anything like that, but these are all it's, it's tough decisions all around before they deal with McDavid. They got to deal with dry cycle because guess what? If dry cycle doesn't want to be there, it's over already right there. Yeah. Never mind Connor McDavid. If dry cycle has gone, the Good operation's point. over. He's he's not as important as Connor McDavid, but oh my goodness. I mean, he's right there next on the list in terms of the Oilers' most important players when it comes to actually winning a Stanley Cup. So they're going to have some tough, tough th- decisions to make. And and I agree, you just got to take emotion out of it. Like me and Lepore, we have completely accepted the fact that there's a possibility that Matthews might not be here. The same thing with Nylander. We've talked about this on the show. And it doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter how much we love Austin Matthews and how much Leafs Nation loves him. Like, if he doesn't want to be here and he's he doesn't sign an extension, then they're going to have to deal him. Now, I have gone on the record and said that I don't think that, that it's going to get to that point. Like, I think Matthews is going to re-sign. But guess what? If he doesn't sign that extension on July 1st, 2023, as I said, then you have to consider trading him. And it's the same thing with Connor McDavid. Like, if this team is going to continue on this trajectory... Where they're not getting any better, Lapore. I heard from every Oilers fan in the offseason, they're a true Stanley Cup contender. This team is ready to take the next step. This team stinks right now. Stinks. I'm sorry for for for, for to have Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisettel on your team. You should not have the 20th best record in the NHL and a negative goal differential at five on five. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, can Little you imagine things, this team's power play wasn't as good as it was, Lapore? Where they would be in the standings right now? Yeah, they're a bottom feeder. It's scary, they're a bottom man. feeder. But it, little things, right? Like, and not to bring it up, the Jack Campbell signing. Imagine they had that money to make a splash. Things might be different. And you mentioned Dry Settle too. You said he's got Dry Settle has two years left after this. Yeah. So even even to evaluate that as a team and as an organization, what the hell would be the return for Leon Dry Settle for two years at in at an eight million dollar salary? King's ransom. Oh my God. So again, you should want that. And and let's face it, Dry Seidel, it's funny because I remember we all trashed that contract when it got signed by uh by it was Shirelli, right? Who signed that deal? Yeah. We were all making fun of him, like eight million. What has he done? Ends up being one of the best contracts in the National Hockey League. He he, like McKinnon, is probably gonna want to play catch up with his next deal. So I can see him just totally going to free agency and being like, who's the highest bidder? Or just cornering whatever team have, whether it's Edmonton or he gets traded or whomever, cornering that team into the biggest contract possible because he's been underpaid and he's a human and he's allowed to feel he's been underpaid and he's allowed to go for as much money as he wants and as much as he thinks he deserves. And I think everyone's eyes have been open up to the possibility of of all of these things happening as we've talked about, you know, McDavid and Dreisaitl leaving Edmonton, Matthews leaving Toronto, because we've now seen it. Right in recent history, we saw it with John Tavares, and then we just saw it last season with Matthew Kachuk and Johnny Gaudreau. That's right. Like, we just saw this. Those guys didn't want to be in Calgary. They're two best players. And now look at Calgary. Like, they're struggling as well. And that's why, like, you, you, it's, it's, it's in the realm of possibility. That's all I'm going to say. Like, you have to consider these things, especially if Edmonton is going to continue playing as poorly as they have been playing. I don't think Connor McDavid is going to be happy there. Like, it's just plain and simple. Like, why are you going to attach yourself to that situation? I get it. They won two rounds last year. But did you know, Lepore, 
The Oilers are 9 and 15 in their last 24 playoff games. The Leafs have a better record. Uh, I think I've heard that stuff. In their last yeah. 25 to, to 27 playoff games than the Oilers do. The Oilers are 9 and 15. So don't get blinded by the fact like, oh, we made the conference finals. Well, guess what, Oilers fans? You've also been swept twice over recent playoff runs. 9 and 15 over their last 25 playoff games. And that's with Connor McDavid and Leon Draisaitl going absolutely nuclear last season in the playoffs, having like the two best playoff performances we've seen since like Gretzky and Lemieux. Yeah. So yeah, it's no, just I, that, that, that's a stat. That, that's a stat, Bruno. I, th- I think what fans do as well is we look back on players from different eras. And of course, like there's like the Eisermans of the world that only played for one team. Um, Joe Sackick comes to mind, Mario Lemieux. But quite often there's like these legends we look at, even guys with like their numbers in the rafters. And we picture them with the team. And then you look it up and they weren't with that team for very long. Like a big one is Gilmore. I think Gilmore had only played what five seasons in Toronto. So players move on. Like it's not this thing where they're there for 15 years all the time. And even Matthews, let's say Matthews walks at the end of his deal. That's eight years. Played eight years with the Toronto Maple Leafs. That's that's half his career. Like we can still look at him. Like, yeah, he spent a lot of time here. And I'm not saying we should be okay with the player leaving. But my point is that sometimes I think we forget that these things are temporary and not all these players just end up being in soccer. They call them like one club mans, like, like one team players essentially in hockey. So we have to prepare for it. And I know Oilers fans, I mean, those hairs are raising on their neck (laughs) hearing this conversation. They're freaking out a little bit and it sucks. I mean, and I made the point about what the hall would be in a McDavid or dry sidle trade. And at the end of the day, you're not getting a player like that back. And even the collection of players is not going to be as valuable as having Connor McDavid or Leon Dreisaitl in your lineup. But you have to do the best you can to move forward. And I'm not completely shitting on it. I'm not saying it's going to happen. Connor McDavid wants the fuck out of Edmonton. I'm just saying if he doesn't see himself there long term, the same goes for Dreisaitl. They got to make moves, man. They got to make moves. Yeah, I if I had to say whether he's going to stay or go, honestly, at this point, I would say he's probably going to go. I'd bet he's not going to finish. As it stands now, with the job Ken Holland has done, and by that I mean a terrible job, why would he stay? Seriously. And I know Oilers fans, again, you don't want to hear that. This team, it's hard for the, it, it's going to be hard for them to be like ultra competitive. And I know they're losing, they don't have Kane, as you mentioned. So they are better than what we're seeing now. But we're talking about maybe the best player we've ever seen. The goal is Stanley Cups. Like a lot would have to change for this team in the next few years for them to be like a legitimate Stanley Cup contender. Like this team's going to win a Stanley Cup. So if I had to bet on it right now, he's not going to retire an Oiler. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, you could look at Ovechkin and say he didn't win a Stanley Cup until like year or whatever it was, like 13 or 14 of his career. But year in and year out, the Capitals were one of the best teams in the NHL. Yeah, they, they were winning two presidents, presidents tro- trophies, yeah. top five record in the league. The same cannot be said for the Edmonton Oilers. I'm sorry, Oilers fans, but year in and year out, you are not one of the best teams in the league. I don't care that you won two rounds last year. Now you're 20th in the league again. This is not the same situation as as Alexander Ovechkin in the Capitals, who year in and year out had one of the best records, were one of the top scoring teams, good defensively. Like every year they were a good team. And the same thing cannot be said about Edmonton. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see because, like I said, the first domino is going to fall with Dry Depending on what he decides to do, I think that'll pretty much determine the future of, of Connor McDavid, similar to what happened in Calgary with Johnny Gaudreau leaving. And then all of a sudden you start hearing all the the rumors up. Oh, Matthew Kachuk wants out as well. So yeah, and this, this, this may come off like a stupid question, but what do you think, or what would you trade more for McDavid at his salary or dry at his salary? I'd still want McDavid. Yeah, me too. I just thought, I, I just thought, I just thought yeah. I'd throw it out there because there, there is that thing of like the crazy price you're getting dry side a lot. But yeah, Connor McDavid. So guys, comment down below if you think otherwise or agree with us. Yes, let us know in the comments, should the Edmonton Oilers actually trade Connor McDavid before his contract runs out? Mm -mm -mm. 
wild, wild times. All right, Lapore, anything else you want to get off your chest before we wrap up this podcast? No, I think I shot on my favorite hockey team enough talking about uh, last night's game. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the next one is in uh, Seattle. Good Seattle. It, it, has there been, like, I don't know in my life, if there's been a lower key, really good team than, than the Seattle Kraken. Like you don't hear anything about them. And I'll even admit it going through the calendar. I was like, oh, Seattle, that's a game they should. Oh, wait, no, Seattle's actually, yeah, they're actually good. playing really well. Some good young kids, strong team. They're getting goaltending. So, yeah, just uh, looking forward to that one. Again, new team. I mean, second season in the league. I haven't seen too many games against the Kraken, so looking forward to that one. Yeah, that's going to be a good game because, as you said, man, Seattle is low-key really good. Like, they're yeah. one of the best five-on-five -five teams in the league. They're holding down a playoff spot right now. Pretty crazy, man. So that's going to be a great game against the Seattle Kraken. Funny, eh, how everyone was uh, calling Ron Francis an idiot about a year ago. One of the you know, legend of the NHL. This guy's got no idea what he's doing. Yeah, oh, he yeah? completely botched the expansion yep. draft. He should be ashamed of himself. Yep. Complete opposite of what Vegas did. And yep. now look at the Seattle Kraken. Exactly. Like no Love one's saying running. they're you know going to win the Stanley Cup this season, but to be in a playoff spot and be one of the best five on five teams in the league. Shout out to you, Ron Francis. Friggin' right. Friggin' right. All right. That is going to do it for episode 87 of the Gluns for Punishment podcast, or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Laporte and Anthony Bruno. If you just listened to us for the, the first time, or if you've been a longtime listener and you really enjoyed this episode, please do us a favor. You have no idea how much this will help. If you give us a five-star rating and review on either Apple or Spotify, whichever platform you use, and if you're watching us on YouTube, we would appreciate more than you could ever imagine. If you smash the like button, comment down below, subscribe to the channel, and then you could also ring the notification bell if you want to know exactly when the GFP podcast is dropping some new content. So for Michael Lapore, I'm Anthony Bruno. Once again, Happy New Year, everybody. Mm -hmm. And we will see you in the next one. Thanks, everyone.